Well, this is both a personal and partly a culmination of, of academic life. I taught for 54 years at the college, and my principal course was recent U.S. history focused on the New Deal. Uh, the students used to call it bend the knee to Franklin D. in recent U.S. history. But I lived through that time. Uh, I was born in 1921. So I was eight years old when the stock market crashed in 1929. Now my story is going to be a little peculiar because in a way I was detached from the Great Depression. I was an observer except for one episode I'll tell you about. Um, my father was a engineer, my mother was a school teacher. Uh, I was sent to one of the great schools of the country, a John Dewey School, the Lincoln School of Teachers College of Columbia University. It was magnificent. It made all my subsequent education look pallid after that. And so I, I didn't really experience the, the Great Depression. And here's an embarrassing thing that happened. In March 1933, March 1933, a quarter of the country was unemployed. I set sail with my mother and sister for a six month trip in Europe. Uh, and uh, we went from France to Switzerland to Italy to Austria to Germany. I went, my sister and I went to a French speaking Swiss camp for six weeks by ourselves. We went to museums. I learned to love the Louvre. I learned, well, you can imagine what a trip like that. I was like, we went to Germany, Munich, and Hitler had just come to power. And I remember seeing on the street brown shirted stormtroopers with Nazi armbands walking down the street. And every few steps, they would meet some one of them coming in the other direction. And they'd stop, click their heels, and say, Sie Heil. We thought that was funny. It was like a comic opera. It wasn't funny, as, as, as you well know. And our, the Depression, we, incidentally, we had to postpone our sailing because Roosevelt closed the banks and my mother couldn't get the money out in order to let us go. But then the next summer, 1934, my father lost his job. He was the superintendent of the metal works at the Eagle Pencil Company, one of the uh, big, and uh, I was sent to a public school in the ninth grade, the DeWitt Clinton Junior High School, and I was miserable. I was so far ahead of all the other students, and, but I came into contact with different kinds. The Lincoln School was an elite school. Uh, I, my family wasn't wealthy, but the, many of the students there were. Uh, I think Nelson Rockefeller was three classes ahead of me. Some of my classmates lived on Fifth Avenue. Uh, but what I missed was the tremendous intellectual excitement of a first-rate John Dewey school. Uh, much maligned Dewey, but oh no, that school was very, very rigorous. Uh, the next year, I was so miserable in that school that the, my parents scraped together the money and somehow, uh, even though my father was just starting another business, uh, they sent me back and I went to that school and graduated. But I saw the Great Depression, for example, uh, we re I remember 
Riverside Park, as a beautiful park now, as you know, but as far as your eye could see, there were <coughs> 10 tar paper shacks with thousands of people living, including children. Uh, I saw well-dressed men in suits and ties standing behind apple crates on the streets, selling apples, trying to earn a few pennies to take back uh, to their families. When I rode the streetcar on Broadway, I passed the Bank of the United States, which had failed, and every day there was a line of people standing there hopelessly, waiting, waiting. Maybe the bank would open. Maybe they would get some of their money back. It never did open again. One of the moving things I saw once was a very ragged man on the street, unshaven, dirty, and a well-dressed woman took him by the arm and took him into Woolworth's five and 10 store, which had a, a lunch counter. And she sat him down and ordered him a big meal of turkey and gravy and stuffing. And I remember the man sitting there staring at it, almost unable to eat. Uh, I had images in my mind, even as I speak to you today. Now, of course, that was the era of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, in my classes at Colorado College, when I said Franklin Delano Roosevelt, all the students put their hands on their hearts. <laughs> Here, I'll try it on you. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> but my parents were very skeptical of Franklin Roosevelt. He seemed like such an aristocrat, born with a silver spoon in his mouth, and in the election of 1932, uh, they voted for a socialist, Norman Thomas, who you may know about. And uh, I remember my mother, we were listening to the radio, a battery-operated radio uh, was all we had in those days, uh, when the election returns came in. And I remember my mother saying to my father, oh, I hate to see him win. Yeah. Well, later they became ardent New Dealers, uh, very, and we, were, we grew up with the magic of that voice. There it is over there, the magic of his voice in listening to the fireside chats. Uh, I'm not sure whether I heard, uh, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. I, I'm not sure I heard that speech, but I heard many speeches. We clustered around the, the radio the way people all over the country did in those, in those days. Uh, now, in the Lincoln School, I had another opportunity, a marvelous opportunity, to understand something about the Depression. Here, most of these kids were pampered kids. In the, our senior year, which was 1937-38, with a grant from the General Motors Foundation, they took the whole senior class down south for two weeks. Uh, we went to the Tennessee Valley Authority where David Lilienthal spoke to us. We saw the magnificent dams. A friend of mine, Henry Stoyoski by name, we were taken out into the Georgia countryside at night and dropped off in the cabin of a sharecropper where we stayed for two or three days. Uh, living with his family. Uh, we were embarrassed. Uh, we finally asked, where's the bathroom? And they said, well, just go outside along. I was, for a middle class boy, that was hard, hard to understand. We went to the Hampton Institute in Virginia, which was a all black school. We was, among very few white visitors who ever had been there. And we listened to the magnificent choir singing black spirituals. 
I'll never forget that. So Lincoln was a very socially conscious school. That's John Dewey. That is, bring people into contact with the real world. And the real world then was the Depression. And so in a way, even though I had this relatively sheltered life, I was exposed to it with empathy. And I was grateful for that. And now, in, the, in those times, of course, I also participated in the cultural life of the times. We went to the, the escapist movies. Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire, oh boy. <laughs> Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney in the Andy Hardy series. Gary Cooper in The Plainsman. I wish I could see that again. It's not on Netflix. <laughs> I, 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 uh, maybe, maybe you can uh, get it for me, uh, Warren. Uh, and my parents were big lovers of the arts, and they dragged me sometimes kicking and screaming to Carnegie Hall, where I heard uh, uh, Toscanini conduct Beethoven's Fifth and Beethoven's Seventh. Uh, I went to the Metropolitan Opera, and I heard La Lawrence Tibbet, uh, a famous opera singer of the time, I sing. I went to art galleries, as I had done in Europe. My family, I grew up with newspapers and books, with the New York Times, uh, uh, an evening newspaper, the New Yorker, the Nation. Uh, it was a sheltered life, wasn't it? Uh, and I was surrounded by the Depression. I'm a little embarrassed uh, uh, telling you uh, about this. And then when I graduated from uh, 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 high school and went to Columbia College, at the end of my freshman year, I became the athletic counselor at a settlement house camp in upstate New York, out of the city a bit, up in New York. Now, you know what a settlement house is. That's where it was started by uh, uh, the Hull House in Chicago, and then there were uh, house, houses in New York. This was called Madison House Settlement. And every two weeks, a group of children were bussed up to that camp for two weeks of camp, of camp life. I was the athletic counselor. And I remember staring at these children at the first meal when a platter of bread and a pitcher of milk were put on the table and how they reacted. And I discovered that in their lives, 1938 this is, uh, no, no, uh, 1939, the summer of 39, they had never in their lives at home they didn't sit down to a table at, for meals. Mm -hmm. And this was their experience, and uh, oh boy. Uh, then nearby was a CCC camp, and uh, uh, the CC campers came often because we had some pretty girls as campers, <laughs> and they would sit on the wall and watch, and we played softball against them. I was the pitcher. Uh, 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 and we saw something of what it meant for them to be able to have a very small income, which they sent home. Uh, many of the other counselors at that camp were WPA workers, uh, 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 and they were very apprehensive that summer because the WPA was cutting down, and the feared pink slips were coming to them at the end of payday. But not, none of that happened uh, uh, when I was there. But that had a tremendous impression on me, that, that settlement house experience. Another counselor there who I became 
quite friendly with, showed me a nickel one day, which he had in his pocket. He said, this is my security nickel. Uh, I carry it with me in case I have to make a phone call. Uh, he, his family made him lunch. He was going to the City College of New York, which was tuition free. And he took his lunch and he had, was living without any money whatsoever. Now, I had a small allowance, 25 cents a week. That was before college when I was, uh, but that was a lot uh, compared to what these people were, were, living, were living on. Now, uh, so I was living that very comfortable life. Uh, and I learned something from that, which I think about today. I read an article in the New York Times the other day that there are 40 million people in our country today who don't have enough to eat, who uh, eat one meal a day or a meal every other day, a couple of meals every other day, including many, many children. And I thought, now, how is it that I managed to emerge from that experience with a sense of empathy and when I was, wasn't exposed really to it, except for that one year in public school, but there was no real privation. I mean, I, I lived in a house with you know, all these things. We had maids, Irish maids and black maids uh, who would come. Uh, uh, how, how, how do you develop a sense of sensitivity to the suffering around you why did I get that when people I observe in this community and elsewhere don't have it today? And I think it was two things. One, it was my parents who somehow had a lively interest in public affairs and also an understanding, an empathetic understanding for the people who did not live so well. And the other was my school, the Lincoln School of Teachers College, which gave me uh, that appreciation. Now we knew about the depression, of course, and you know we knew the jokes, like that famous joke about the man who wore shoes two sizes too small for him. And he was asked, why do you do that? And he said, well, my wife is sick, my son is in jail, my daughter is a prostitute, and the only pleasure I get in life is when I take my shoes off at night. <laughs> well, that's it. That's the kind, you know, that's depression era black humor. Another thing I, I experienced in those days was prohibition. And uh, uh, my father was a teetotaler. Uh, his father had been a drunkard. And he de was determined never, ever uh, to touch a drop of liquor. When my sister got married, he said he would drink some champagne. But when I gave it to him, I saw him rub his lips on the glass, but he didn't drink. Uh, but we would have parties, and uh, their friends brought paper bags. <laughs> And they went in the kitchen, and then they came out with glasses, and my father would stand in the corner with his lips pursed, uh, looking at this scene. And then uh, I remember seeing speakeasies and around, and then the liberation of 1933, when Franklin Roosevelt said at dinner one night, I think this would be a good time for beer. And, and that was even before uh, repeal, which came about uh, later later that year. So I don't know what whether that's a very enlightening story that I've I've just told you. Uh, I li I like to think of ways. I try to do this with my students. I used to say to them, uh, 
at the end of these classes, I, my classes, I would say, uh, I don't care whether you become a Democrat or a Republican. That wasn't entirely true, by the way. <laughs> But I hope you will be involved in public affairs in the world around you. And I hope that you will be understanding and empathetic for people less fortunate than you, who but for the accident of fate might be yourselves. And I. I would, I would always regarded that as one of my function. I wanted them to get that. I didn't care so much whether they knew about the provisions of the second Agricultural Adjustment Administration, <laughs> even though I taught them that. I wanted them to get some sort of feeling for what that was like to live in the Great Depression. And then, of course, in the summer of 1939, the war came, and I was then ushered into a very new world of reality. Thank you.